Good morning and welcome to worship at St. James United Methodist Church. It is a joy to be here with you on this, the day that the Lord has made for us to rejoice and join together in worship of our Almighty God. As we gather together, I want to draw your attention to some of the announcements that are printed in the order of worship here. Uh, first of all, we welcome Reverend Jimmy Moore back again this week. He was with us last week and, and will be preaching again while John and Emily are out. And we are thrilled to have him here and to enjoy what he has to say to us this morning. This evening at the food trucks, the food trucks will be here, uh, a bouncy house will also be here. So if you would like to come and, and, and enjoy the, the company and the fellowship of, of bouncing together and, and eating together, uh, please make plans to come back this evening for the food truck night. The back to school drive is still happening. Uh, the goal is to collect 100 backpacks and school supplies to fill those packs. Uh, next Sunday is the Sunday when they are due. So uh, you still have time out in the narthex. There's a table with a shopping list. So you can go pick up that list and go out this week to collect those items and then bring them back to the church anytime this week. But you can bring them back next Sunday as well to help us reach that goal of 100 backpacks. I see that our youth are back. Our youth were gone on a mission trip this weekend to Restoration Atlanta. So welcome back, guys. We're thrilled to, to see you. Did you have a good time? Awesome. All right. Good, good work. Thank you guys for being there. We've been in our prayers, and we're thrilled that you're in worship this morning. I want to invite you as we continue to gather to find those fellowship pads on your pews, uh, whether you are a longtime member or a first-time visitor, uh, I ask that you would fill those out so that we can have a record of your attendance. Uh, and you can also let us know if there's anything you need us to, to connect with you about on those pew pads as well. Let us now turn and greet one another with signs of peace and reconciliation. Several weeks ago, I was uh, looking at cards for my dad for Father's Day, and I, I saw a card that said something like this. He said, Dad, thanks to your lectures, I never change horses in the middle of a job worth doing. I know the squeaky wheel gets the worm, and I never count my chickens until I've walked a mile in their shoes. And you thought I wasn't listening. It's pretty silly, but what a gift it is to be able to listen to take the time to listen, to pause, to ask God to guide us. And so this morning we will join together in a time of silent prayer as we prepare for worship, as we ask God to open our hearts, our spirits, and our lives that we might hear God calling us today. Let us pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. God has abundantly cast God's seeds of love and hope upon us. May you be fruitful soil for the planting and growing of hope and peace. Come, let us praise God who is so generous with us. Let us sing songs of joy to God. Alleluia. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please remain standing for hymn number 96, Praise the Lord Who Reigns Above.
may be seated, and as you are, I invite our children to come forward for a time uh, together with Elizabeth Johnson this morning. Let our children come forward now. Good morning, everyone. Come on down here. Good morning. How fun was that? I haven't seen two pianos playing together. I don't know if I've ever seen that in church. Did you all notice that? Both of the pianos played that hymn together. Wasn't that cool? I think we should give them a thumbs up. Tell them thumbs up. Good job. I am thinking of planting some flower seeds. And I needed to know, so give, get some advice from you. They're, these are hummingbird flowers. Aren't they pretty? I was thinking it would be really cool if we had some flowers outside where Miss Susan Fleck gives the lemonade after church. Don't you think that would be pretty? I was thinking I would just throw these seeds right on the sidewalk and next week see if there are some flowers there. You think there will be flowers there? How come? Why don't you think they will grow? You think there would be flowers? Why don't you think there would be flowers there? No dirt. I probably shouldn't throw them on the sidewalk then, huh? What if I take them home and put them in some really nice soil, dirt, and I pack them down in there really nice, and I put them in my closet at home? I can't dig my closet, but what's missing in my closet that the flowers would need to grow? Water and sun. Okay, so it sounds like I need soil to make the roots get down in there. Can't grow on the sidewalk. Got to get down in there and have good roots. I need water and I need sunlight. So those three things might help my seeds to grow, right? Well, I kind of think of the soil like the Bible, or like God's Word. We need that in our lives to make the roots of God's love grow deeper, right? We've got to have the Bible, and we've got to have God's Word. Otherwise, the seeds of God's love it aren't going to grow in us very well. Also, we need the water, and the water to us to make God's love grow is Jesus, and a relationship with Jesus, and praying to Jesus. Some people call him the living water. And the other thing we need is sunlight. And I think of sunlight like the Holy Spirit. So that gives us three things, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those things are going to help the seeds of God's love grow in our heart. There's one other thing about growing flowers, and this is what I'm really bad at, the weeds. I do not like weeds. I have to be completely honest. I look at things and I wonder, is that a weed or is that a herb or something good? I don't know. Should I pull that out? So sometimes I have to get help from other people discovering if it's a weed. Well, when we think about planting God's love, the seeds of God's love in us, sometimes there's some weeds and it stops God's love from growing. So I'm going to name some things, and you're going to tell me if that's a weed that should be pulled out or if that's okay to stay for God's love. What if I have meanness in my heart? Is that a weed? That's a weed. Get rid of it. How about if I have hope in my heart? Not a weed. That can stay and grow right along with God's love. How about worry? That's a weed. That's my big weed. That's a weed. God's love does not grow very well with that worry. We need to be peaceful and, and give our worry up to God. How about, um, I had another one, good one here. How about lying? That is so a weed. I could see that weed a mile away. How about... Jealousy. Do y'all know that word, jealousy? It's a weed. That's a weed. I agree, it's a weed. So we're going to listen to the sermon later, some of you that are staying, and some of you will go out to um, children's worship. But 
We're, the adults are going to learn about this parable that's in the Bible, talking about the seeds and what they need for God's love to grow. And you guys got it down. You know it needs soil and water and sun. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for these children. Thank you for the beauty of their innocence. And um, thank you for just the joy that they bring in our church. It's a small group, and we ask that you bless each of these children, help them learn and grow, and that God's seed will be planted deep in their hearts and their minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to give you some seeds. Who wants some seeds? Okay, go ahead, and you can take these back and either go to your parents. You can take two each because I have so many. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and I can't wait to see the flowers that come from those seeds that are planted this week. Let us turn now together to a time of prayer. Uh, listed in your order of worship, you will see the concerns and celebrations of this community. Uh, I'd like to lift up a few of those before you now. Uh, Lawrence Montgomery has moved to the man house, so he moved this week to the man house. So as you continue to hold him in your prayers, you may uh, make that change to your notes. We also have a lot to celebrate this morning. We want to share congratulations to Emily and Andy Moon in the birth of their granddaughter, Isla. Also to Joni and David Tolls and Elizabeth Tolls, who is a great grandma, in the birth of, of Brooks. We also celebrate the weddings of Lee and Josh Branch and Betsy and Stephen Culpepper. And finally, we celebrate that Benjamin Johnson was uh, sworn in and is attending now the United States Naval Academy. So there is much, much to celebrate this morning. And we remember in all of these celebrations that God is the one who answers prayer and walks with us both in times of celebration and in times of sorrow. And so this morning, let us offer our prayers and give thanks to the one who comforts, restores, and heals. Let us move now together to this time of prayer by singing together our call to prayer into my heart. God of goodness and growth, let your love be made real in us this day, for you are our God who hears us, holds us, and helps us. You are our eternal source of blessing and our endless source of provision. In your compassion, you see our needs, you heal our sickness and satisfy our hunger. Hear us this morning as we pray for the church the world, and all who are in need. Faithful God, this morning we confess that at times your word falls on hardened ground. There are times when our worldly anxiety and attachments crowd out your place in our lives. But we know that your perfect love casts out sins. So forgive our frail and human ways and cultivate in us a spirit of trust and faithfulness. With the confidence of forgiveness, may we be at peace in you, for you are our God who strengthens, restores, and brings water to our soul in parched and hardened places. Strengthen us for our journey in your name. We pray this morning for all the leaders and people of this world. You have created us, your children, 
to live and to flourish in peace. Give us the wisdom to order our world that all may find shelter, sustenance, and love. We pray for your church. May we be faithful, loving, and wise. Give us strength to follow Christ until all are reconciled by his grace. We pray for those who are sick, who suffer need, or who are in danger. For those who we listed this morning, as well as those who we hold silently in our hearts. You have made us to love and care for one another. Give us the compassion and skill to love our neighbor and to seek the well-being of those who are in need. Teach us to act, to tend the world you love, to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you have made room for us. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we profess our faith together with the historic words of the affirmation of faith found on 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and as you are, I invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare now to give of our tithes and offerings. Let us offer together the fruit of our labor to God, and may the gifts that we offer this day spread the good news of the abundant life in Christ.
Let us turn now together and join in singing hymn number 707, the hymn of promise. The gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. If you'd like to follow along, you can do that in your pew Bibles on the New Testament, page 16. Let us hear now these words from Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Our thanks be to be God. God. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again. And let me say again how good it is for me to be with you today and last week. And how grateful I am for your gracious and kind and warm hospitality and reception of me. I want to say a particular word of thanks to Elizabeth and Michael and Craig for their help in keeping me straight, mostly up here in the chancel area, and I'm very grateful for their help and guidance. And aren't you grateful for Gabby this morning and her music for us? So <clears throat> we appreciate your sharing that message in song. Uh, may we pray? Well, I also want to thank John for the invitation to be here. I'm grateful to him for his friendship and for this invitation. Now may we pray. Oh God, we pray that it would be your word that is uh, spoken and heard today and that I would not impede that and that we would leave today better able to be your people in this time and in this place. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, we want to think for a few moments about this parable of the sower. And as I was working with that this week, one of the things that struck me was this call to listen. When you get to the parable part of our passage, the first word is listen. When the parable is complete, Matthew says, let those who have ears listen. It's like Matthew wants to get us by the shoulders and shake us a little bit and say, pay attention to this. There's something significant going on in this story. And so we come to hear today this parable about the sower. And there's movement in this parable. It, it moves, I think, in two or three different ways. And at the beginning of the parable, it raises a question for me about what is going on with this sower. This is not a careful, prudent planter. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a sower unlike any farmer that I know anything about. I don't know what it was like back in Jesus' day, but he's not like any farmer that I know about. My wife Julie and I know a little bit. We're not world-class experts, but uh, we have a garden. We got our house uh, several years back, and I was mowing grass one day and realized we had a sunfill on the side of the uh, house, and I thought we could put a garden here, and we've done that. And we jokingly say that we think we now have one of the larger working farms in DeKalb County at our house. And you're welcome to come and get some produce anytime. But uh, we, we've worked hard to sort of nourish the soil. There's a, I've shoveled a lot of mulch on there. We've had uh, grass clippings and leaves from trees that we've plowed under, and we've got some pretty good dirt out there now. And when it comes time to plant, we don't plant like this sower. We don't go out and just throw seed all over the place. We don't throw seed out on the street. We don't throw seed on the paths that we walk around in the garden. We don't throw seed in the flower beds that Julie has on the outside of the garden. That's not the way we plant. I work the ground with a tiller and try to get it ready, and then one of us, often Julie, We'll take a hoe and we'll make a furrow in the dirt. And we try to get that straight and we mark it so we know where the furrows are. And then we go down and we plant seed by seed in the furrow. And we do that to try to get the best results that we think we can get. And, and that's how we plant. But that's not what this sower does, is it? He is out there, according to the parable, just throwing seed all over the place. And it goes hither and yon, and he gets not only good soil, but some soil that's not so good. And so we might want to ask, well, why is this sower doing this? Well, the beginning of the answer to that question, I think, comes from when we realize that this sower is not planting uh, okra and squash and beans and peas. This is a parable that is trying to tell us something about God and about the kingdom of heaven. Master preacher Tom Long says in writing about this parable that the sower uses methods that are consistent with the kingdom of heaven. He is extravagant and risk-taking and crazy almost in his sowing, because he is modeling the God who lavishes mercy and grace on the entire world all over the place. The sower represents for us this God of ours who is concerned for the entire world, who wants to be in relationship with every person in the world and is willing to look ridiculous and is willing to do foolish things and is willing to scatter seed all over, knowing that some of it probably won't take, but hoping and praying that some will, because God cares so much about this world. Ted Wardlaw was the pastor at Central Presbyterian Church downtown across from the Capitol for a number of years, and in his writing about this text, he suggests that the sower sows the way he does because anywhere, is the arena for God's work and love and care. The sower sows the way he does to suggest that God's vision for the world is often apprehended in strange and broken places. This is a God willing to go anywhere in order to share God's grace and God's love and God's goodness. 
Now, if Long and Wardlaw and others are correct, and I think they are, this is big and it's good news for the world. God is out there active, scattering seed left and right, hoping and praying that every person will come to know God and know the abundant life that Jesus has to offer. It's good news. It's also, I believe, an invitation for God's church to be scattering seed in that same way. To be extravagant and risk-taking and bold in scattering the good news of God's love around so that others might hear. And this is a church, I believe, that knows something about that. You have food trucks that come here every Sunday, don't you? And that's a good thing, I think. People come who might not be here otherwise. And we don't know how you'll connect with all of them. Some will come and eat and go home and never come back. But you're going to make connections with some, I bet. Some of you in this church, I know from hearing John talk, tutor at an elementary school over in the Cross Keys area. And that's a wonderful way of taking God's love out into the community and sharing it with those who might not know it or hear it any other way. I've heard a lot about the new worship services coming in the fall, and this is another wonderful way, I believe, that this church is trying to expand its reach and receive new people into fellowship and into the uh, saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. And, and this parable invites the church to do that, to be about this, um, this scattering that's extravagant and risk-taking and uncertain at points, but trusting in God. Now, I got to thinking about this a little bit more this week, and um, I have to apologize to John. I'm well aware that I don't have any authority in this church, so you hear this next just as some thinking of a guest preacher, and if some of it is interesting to you, then maybe you can begin to have some discussions down the road. But I got to thinking about if I were in a church in this community, were there other ways that I might think about scattering the seed of God's love in Jesus Christ? Now, you can do this better than I can because you know your church and your community better than I do, but I had a couple of thoughts. I was thinking about these soccer fields down here on Windsor Parkway and all of the people that go down there and play soccer on Sunday morning and who probably will never uh, come to a church on Sunday morning. And I've been reading about fresh expressions and this idea of the church going out into the community, and I was thinking about... Well, what would it be like if a church in this community went down to the soccer fields on Sunday morning, not to rant and rave at people, but to set up a hospitality table or a hospitality tent down there? And maybe you do like Sheldon suggests in the Big Bang Theory, and you have a refreshing beverage that you offer to people who might choose to come by your tent. Maybe there would be some people who would be willing to engage in just some conversation. I could envision a, a board, a clipboard that had a, an opportunity for people to say, uh, you know, I'd love for you to pray for me. And it could write their name down. Or maybe you have a prayer box down there that uh, people could put prayer cards in. And so that there might be an opportunity to embody the love of Jesus Christ in that soccer field. Or I was thinking about Northside Hospital and the thousands of babies that are born there every year. Uh, our, one of our granddaughters was born there. And I, I don't know what's already going on there. This may be redundant and unnecessary. But I'm wondering if there are mothers and fathers over there who don't have extended family in this community who might benefit from having someone who could come and visit them and stay with them and help them as they adjust to having a new child in their family. Or might there be an opportunity for some very, very simple and inexpensive gift, maybe just a card that says, we love you and we care for you. If you need something and want us to pray for you, here's how to get in touch with us. Or another idea I had, and this would be the hardest one, I can't quite make this work because I know there are legal issues involved, but I wonder if Jesus might have a place at Phipps Plaza or Lenox Square. If there would be some way for the church to embody uh, God's grace and love on the site of those major shopping malls. I have a friend who's doing interesting stuff on the streets of Los Angeles out of the First United Methodist Church in Los Angeles. And I, I find myself wondering, might there be a way for a church to take the love of Jesus to Lenox Square? 
I don't know. That would be for y'all to think about. Uh, but uh, I think the parable invites us to have these kinds of discussions and thinking about how might we scatter the seed in our community. And I believe that that can be very exciting. It can be energizing as we think about how to engage people with this love of God and, and the grace of God and the life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it can also be frustrating at points, and the parable knows this too. There's a movement in the parable to say some of the ground out there is really not very receptive to God's grace and God's love. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Sometimes you're going to sow things, and there's not going to be any fruit that will come out of that. Uh, a pastor that John and I both like is a Lutheran pastor named Delmer Chilton, and Delmer tells a story when he was a college student of working on a tobacco farm in eastern North Carolina. And he said they were out there working one day, and they had this thing he called a harvester that was pulled by a tractor, and there were some people that sat down low, almost ground level on this harvester, and as it went down the row, they picked the leaves from the tobacco plants. And then there was a conveyor belt that went up high, eight or ten feet, I think, and there was another group of people up there. They were the stringers. And the, the croppers put the tobacco plants on the conveyor belt. It went up to the stringers. And they put them on poles that would then go to the barn for curing. Delmer says that one day they were out there working and the harvester was not working properly. Uh, the conveyor belt was broken. It just wasn't doing right. And the leaves kept falling off. And they had to keep stopping and trying to to pick up the leaves and see if they could get things to work the way it was supposed to work, and they were not having much success. And there was a six-year-old boy over there who was a friend of the family who was watching all of this, and at one point when they were struggling, he came over to the owner and he said, Well, you can't elevate them all, can you, Mr. Virgil? You can't elevate them all. And the parable knows this. You can't elevate them all. Some ground is not going to be receptive. Jesus knows this. This is a part of Matthew's gospel where Jesus is having some hard times. His family is raising questions about him. There are cities, he says, where I've done miracles and they've just not responded in any way to the good news. There are people out here that heard John and heard me and they don't get it. There's a lot of uh, bad soil that Jesus has dealt with. He understands that. And Matthew's church, I think, would understand that as well. There's evidence that they were struggling also and having some difficulty in getting the word heard and responded to and to bear fruit. And that can happen. But the parable, I believe, encourages us to continue scattering seed because we just don't know what's going to happen. I was thinking this week, working on this, about a uh, time early in my ministry when I was in the Gainesville area, and a friend of mine invited me and another friend to join him in doing a weekly Bible study in the Hall County Jail in Gainesville. And we agreed to do that, and I will say that's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. But we went down there every Wednesday, and we would sing a little bit and pray a little, and then we would rotate around doing a Bible study with these inmates there in the Hall County Jail. And you wonder when you're doing something like that, are, are any of these seeds that we're scattering connecting? Is there anything good, any fruit coming out of this? And it's really hard to tell. It was for me. Uh, the people were kind to us and they seemed uh, somewhat attentive most of the time, but then they would go back to their cells and we would leave and we wouldn't see them for another week and it was just hard to know. But I remember one young man named Jeffrey. And Jeffrey had been there for a while. He'd come to some of our Bible studies and he was getting out. And Jeffrey came to us and said, I've been listening. I want to do better with my life. Will you pray for me? Because I know when I get out, I've got to go back into this community where it's hard and difficult and it's going to be tough. Will you pray for me? And it was a glimmer there that in that dark place, maybe some fruit uh, did emerge 
And so the parable, I think, encourages us to continue to sow because we're not sure what might happen by God's grace at a certain point. But the parable also encourages us to keep on keeping on and to keep sowing because there's a great harvest coming at the end. And it's fascinating in the movement of this parable where it ends. It ends not with the hard ground, but it ends with this abundant, overflowing harvest. The Bible scholars say that for farmers in Jesus' day, a return of 7 to 1 or 10 to 1 would have been magnificent. Any farmer would have been overjoyed with that kind of return. But what does this parable talk about? It's not wasting time on sevenfold or tenfold returns. It says there's a harvest coming and it's going to be a hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirtyfold. It's going to be beyond your wildest imagining. God is at work. You may not can see it. The road is hard sometimes, but God is at work and there is a harvest coming and you can trust that and you can count on that. It makes me think a little bit of Easter egg hunts with our grandchildren at our house or at their house that we have every year. Some of you probably have similar things. But we'll go to Easter service and then we'll have uh, too much to eat for lunch and then we'll have an Easter egg hunt. And some of us adults will go out and hide the eggs. And then we'll give baskets to our four grandchildren and the race is on. And sometimes there's a little bit of hard ground out there. For the younger ones in particular, there might be a moment or two of confusion. Occasionally, not a lot, but occasionally a little bit of conflict as there's some argument over that particular egg. And once in a blue moon, there might be some tears, so that's pretty rare. But I tell you what's going to happen every Easter egg hunt. There is a guaranteed result of every Easter egg hunt that the Moore family has, and you probably know what it is. At the end of that hunt, guaranteed, every child is going to have a basket that's got enough chocolate in it to make every dentist in three counties happy. Guaranteed, every child is going to have a basket full of chocolate. And it's guaranteed because my wife, Julie, known as Booma in our family, And our daughter, Allison, the mother of the four, they're going to make sure it happens. The rest of us help, but they're going to be darn sure that every grandchild has an overflowing basket. It's an abundant harvest, and you can go to the bank on that every Easter. Matthew says here in this story that that, that there's a harvest coming. It's coming by the grace of God and by the goodness of God and the the work of God. We may not can always see it. We participate a little when we scatter seed here, there, and yonder. But God is going to bring this harvest. And you can go to the bank on that, church, because God is faithful. And God will do what God says God will do. So, church, we have this parable of the sower this morning. And it reminds us of a God who is lavish in bestowing mercy and grace on the world and invites us as God's people to do the same in our communities. It reminds us that sometimes that work will be frustrating and will not bear the the results that we might wish. But it invites us to keep on scattering seed and to keep on trusting God because a harvest is coming that will be abundant beyond our wildest imagining. And Matthew says, let those who have ears listen. Amen and amen. And we're going to invite you to stand as you're able now to sing this great hymn, number 451, Be Thou My Vision.
church, we are called to go into the world following our wonderful God, sowing seed left and right. And we do that trusting that God goes before us and with us. And so we leave today trusting and believing that the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with us this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.